Today's lecture is uh, about uh, automation, business process automation. It's the first of three lectures on business process automation. Uh, if I put it in the perspective of the business process management life cycle, we can say we've done uh, a good half of it. So we have gone through uh, process <coughs> modeling, process dis discovering processes and capturing them as BPM and process models, uh, analyzing process both quantitatively and qualitatively to identify issues, to quantify those issues, the impact of those issues, to prioritize those issues, to identify their causes as well, and then use them for thinking about how to change the process in order to address the issues. And what we get out of that is a 2B process model. The last homework you did had one of its output was a 2B process model uh, that you, uh, uh, you should have documented in BPMN. Uh, the, the next uh, part is actually to take that to be process model and to turn it into what we would call an executable process model. In a way, you want to take the process and you want to automate it in an existing information system. So there are several approaches to do this. You know, I mean, that, that the, uh, one approach is to simply take the to be process model as a basis to derive requirements so that you build an information system using whatever software development methods you want to apply, mainstream software development methods. That is what you saw with Feynman uh, last week. So it kind of made you think how do you take a process model and scope uh, a development project and define requirements for a development project. And then you can go on and apply you know, your group or your scroll methods and use your favorite uh, programming environment, e.g. Ruby, on Rails and develop an application that supports the business process. So that, that is one approach. Uh, and there's nothing wrong about it. It's, it's a very, very valid approach. It's pretty much, for example, what we were doing last semester in enterprise system integration, where we took like, essentially a process, a 2B process, and we uh, implemented it uh, you know, using traditional development methods uh, uh, on top of uh, a, a Java EE application server. Um, another approach, um, which is uh, perhaps used in environments where there is a strong business analysis group uh, and where it is envisaged that a lot of changes will be done to the process, is to actually take the process itself, the process model itself, and turn it into something that is completely executable, that we can deploy in a, in a specialized, let's say, application server called a business process management system, and that will actually create, generate all the, the, the forms and the messages and inputs and outputs that are required to execute the process. And that's what we are going to be seeing, looking at in the next three weeks. Uh, uh, how to take a 2B process model that we have produced after process redesign and turn it into something that has all the information that is needed to actually execute the <coughs> process. Uh, and the problem here is that we will ha be having to bridge two completely different communities. We have on the one hand um, a, a business analysts that are producing the 2B process models. Uh, and on the one hand, on, so these are business analysts, these are process owners, which is managers of the processes themselves. These are uh, subject matter experts, which means people who actually work in the processes and people who manage the people who actually work in the process. So, so these are non-IT people producing process models, most typically perhaps with the help of some IT people, but not necessarily. And we have to turn it into something that will essentially be an IT artifact. You know, something that is completely specified, that is, you know, machine readable, uh, that you can deploy in a server, that you can administ uh, administrate, like a system administrator will do, uh, and make it such that all the process participants are getting the right tasks at the right moment and getting the right information to perform those tasks. And then, so you have here like a business community and you have here uh, um, an IT community. So here is more like business analysts, and here you will have more like developers, administrators, testers, etc. So the, the question is how, what, what, what does it create as a friction? So essentially what it does is that we will have two types of process models essentially that will have to coexist. There's 
so far no better solution than actually acknowledging it and allowing them to coexist. We will have what I would be calling conceptual process models. You know, process models like the ones you have been developing until now. You know, there are tasks, there are gateways, there are swim lanes, there are messages, message flows, there are some data artifacts, not, not that many maybe. Uh, and these things are produced with the help by and usually with the help of the main experts. Um, they, they serve to communicate between stakeholders, they serve to understand what changes need to be made to the pro process, uh, they are meant to be intuitive, you know, they are sometimes meant to be ambiguous because uh, some design choices have not been made at the stage and nobody really wants to make them at the stage anyway. Uh, and in essence they focus on the process, <coughs> the part of the process or the information about the process that is relevant for uh, analysis, that is relevant for redesign, that is relevant for communication between stakeholders. And then we will need to get some executable process models that they, these, these ones will be made by developers uh, a, that will provide, be providing, be giving us input to a, to a machine, you know, to a business process management system. That therefore has to be completely unambiguous and, uh, a, and, and, and it should contain, it should tell you what is the input and what is the output of every task and how would, if you have to present a web form to a user, how should it look like, etc. Um, and, uh, and therefore it contains much more details in a way than this other process will contain. Um, and this has been a, a, a big, I mean, this, this has been this difference between conceptual process model and executable process models um, has been something that has taken a lot of time for, for architects in the field concept, to conceptualize. Um, and the current way of thinking is that not only do we need to have these, and we need to have these, and they need to coexist. But guess what? It doesn't hurt to have another one in the middle, uh, which I would call that to be executed process model. Because um, we are going to see many of the things that you would put in a to be process model that are very relevant are not necessarily tasks that you would want to automate. You know? So those tasks in the to be process models will be dropped in the to be executed process model. But the to be executed process model is still conceptual. You know, you can still show it to someone, right? And and to non-IT people and discuss it. It's not like machine readable. Um, there will be also some uh, a, a, a tasks here that will be merged when you are going to execute it. We're going to see examples. Actually, you saw maybe examples last week with Feynman, where you you have two tasks in the to be process model. But when you want to automate them, maybe you want to put them together for some reasons. Or you have one task in the to be process model, and then you want to detail into multiple tasks in the to be executed process model. So, so we're going to, to have three layers, essentially. It sounds a bit crazy, right? You, know, you have a to be a conceptual model. You, you, you need to have an executable model for execution. And it seems completely crazy that we're going to maintain a third process model but as we're going to see that the difference, the gap between this and this is such that it's quite helpful to discuss uh, in also in terms of the to be executed process model. Or, or if I bring it back to traditional development methods, this is like saying I have like a, a high level model. This will be a domain model, for example. Uh, I have the code. Uh, this will be like a, a SQL uh, database and to bridge these two in the middle I will have some logical data model in the middle which will be the one that uh, you know system analysts uh, are working on day in day out to make decisions about how the database needs to be structured or changed so this is the model of the business analyst this is the model of the system analyst this is the model of the developer do you understand the difference, business analyst, system analyst? Just in case, background, information systems management, right? No? Business analyst is from the business. Not necessarily speaks IT, although some do. Um, and uh, they are meant to be gathering requ business requirements, meaning business needs, 
from different people in the company, people who actually do work, managers, process owners. They need to be selling uh, business plans or development plans to, to the management board, etc. Uh, and uh, uh, acquiring, starting projects, or scoping projects, and giving business requirements to those projects. Nothing to do with IT. And the system <coughs> analyst is typically someone else who takes those business requirements as input uh, and the scope of the project and starts working on splitting the system into pieces, designing the connections between those pieces, and uh, prioritizing creating tasks for this time development tasks for different parts of the system with very precise specifications of what should go in there. And they also work with data models and you know creating the high level data models that will go into implementation. So, so this is the system analysis part. And, and the developers, I guess, that doesn't put you any problem. You understand what they do. Right. So we're going to kind of split things into business analysis, the business analyst model, the system analyst model, and the, the, the code, the developers artifact, which we will call an executable process model because it's not like textual code in the traditional way. It still looks like a BPMN <coughs> process model on the surface. And uh, to, to go from a uh, 2B process model to uh, an executable process model, to a two, first to a 2B executed process model and to an executable process model, we're going to follow uh, a, a method, a step, step-by-step -step method that gives you principles of what you have to consider at each stage. Uh, the first four steps in the method produce you a 2B executed process model, and the fifth step is the one that reaches into the executable process models. You add execution related information to the to be executed process model to, to, to make it actually executable, deployable in a business process management system. <clears throat> and I'm going to take this as an example. It's some examples that is used in, in, the, in the textbook, in chapter 9 of the textbook specifically. It's an um, a order to cache process, uh, typical stuff. Um, and in the order to cache process, there is a seller uh, there is a customer, there, is, there are suppliers. Sellers are sending purchase order, of course, and are receiving invoices and paying. Uh, and the suppliers sometimes receive orders for raw materials that are required in order to produce what the customer needs. So it's a very typical uh, order to cash process where um, the products are not necessarily uh, kept in inventory, although they can. Uh, the first thing when you have a process model like this one and you want to turn it to an executable process model is that you have to decide what, who you are and what you are going to automate. So if I wanted to automate a process from the perspective of, cost of this process from the perspective of a customer, you know, I will do something completely different than if I am the seller. By the way, in the customer side, this process is not called order to cash, it's called procu uh, purchase to pay or procure to pay. If I was trying to automate what the supplier does, I would do something completely different. So you have, if I am doing the seller, I will do something completely different. So we have to be very clear what are we going to automate. And let me say I'm going to automate the seller. So the first thing I'm going to do is, let's forget about this for the moment. Let's forget about this. Let's forget about this. This is the pool I want to automate. This is the, the entity for which I want to develop a system. We're going to focus on that one. You know? Understood? So lesson number one in an executable, in a to-be-executed process model, everything else except what you need disappears, right? So this is okay for a conceptual process model if you want to understand when do we send messages to whom and, and what do we send. But when we are going to execute, this is gone. So I have a process model, this time with a single pool, and now I'm splitting it up. I, I have a sales department and a warehouse and distribution department, like I'm zooming in inside, okay? And this is an order to cash process where you receive uh, an order for physical products uh, and you check whether they are available in stock because you do have a stock of finished products that you can ship to the product. And occasionally uh, the product is there, so we retrieve it from the warehouse. We confirm the order with the customer and then off we go for the invoicing part of the process. But sometimes, um, when I check the stock availability, it turns out that some products are not available, and uh, uh, I have to then figure out 
uh, if we have the required raw materials to produce the product for the customer, the finished product. So I have to consult with maybe one or two suppliers, depending on the case, whether uh, the materials are available. So I want to request the raw materials from supplier one, and if they are available, eventually the supplier will tell me, uh, yes, they are available, and they will ship it to me. There will be a silence in there, in that part of the process, for a while, until suddenly the products pop up in my, the raw materials pop up in my warehouse, in my inbound warehouse, and then I'm ready to uh, manufacture the products. All the raw materials are there, and then I'm ready to manufacture the products. And then I can confirm the order with the customer, confirm that we are ready to ship, and uh, we uh, go into a shipment mode, we have to obtain the shipment, shipment details, confirm the shipment details with the customer, ship our products, and in parallel we have to send an invoice and uh, monitor for a payment, and when the, the product has been shipped and acknowledged and I have received the payment for the invoice I sent, then I will archive the order and finish. Okay, so this is um, still a 2B, a, a 2B process model. Right? This is what we want to automate. The first, part, the, the, the first step in the method is to identify what are we going to automate, because not everything can be automated, at least not directly as it is conceived in the 2B process model. I think you, you kind of mentioned the you know hinted to this with Palman that there are parts of the process that parts parts of a task that will not necessarily be automated. You know, we have to focus on the other parts. Um, so in the range of how much I can automate the task, um, we tend to distinguish between three types of tasks. The first one is the task that can be fully implemented. I mean, you specify the automated. You specify the scope of the task. Like, for example, the task is to make a wire transfer, and I say, yeah, I can, I can automate that completely, right? I can, I can do a system where, if you have the details of the payment, it connects to the banking system, it sends a, an order, authenticates, authenticated order, etc., and it even tracks whether the payment has been made. If it hasn't been made, it raises whatever exceptions has to raise. Completely and fully automated, right? Or making a, a, a trade, in a, uh, sending a, 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 an order to a stock exchange, etc., or uh, even obtaining a payment from a customer. You know, it's something that, from your perspective, can be completely automated. You know, you just, you know, can can provide the link to the customer to pay, and then you can monitor the payment and figure out if there are any exceptions, etc. So these are completely uh, automated tasks. Then there are some things in the middle, which we call user tasks. It's tasks that you can, you can support with the system partly, but it still requires human intervention. So for example, if you are in an insurance uh, claim handling process, uh, and you, want to, you have a task for assessing an insurance claim, uh, you, you need an, an, a claims handler to look at the case and make a decision you know, you do not necessarily want to automate the decision because the number of rules that you have to include is open-ended. Uh, the set of rules is open-ended. You, you cannot really nail it down. So you need someone to be looking at it, but you can provide support, of course. When it comes to it, assessing a claim, you can provide all the details of the claim, the, you know, the history of the, of the customer, uh, what has been done with that claim, etc., right? And, and all the, the details of past uh, claim that the customer has made, and then you provide information that helps the claims handler to make a decision, and you provide a way for the claims handler to record the decision. A typical user task, you can think about it, the task that a person will perform using a system, the system that will support the process, uh, and uh, uh, that will provide the information, the input that person needs, and will record the decision or output of the task. So that's a user <coughs> task, and that's the most, perhaps the most common one you will find. And then there are these nasty things called manual tasks, nasty from the perspective of automation, uh, uh, where you have to, there, there is something, some physical movement to go and do something. Like for example, you have to deliver a parcel, there is a point in time where someone needs to actually go and deliver the parcel and give it a handsome someone, right? And those ones are not very straightforward to automate, at least not like 
straight away, right? It's not like putting someone, we start the task, I put someone in front of an application, they look at it, they stare at it, and they click somewhere, and that's it. No, it doesn't look like that. There is much more to that in the task uh, than what we uh, see on the surface. So, uh, in BPMN, which is a language that is designed both to support conceptual processes and executable processes, the, there is a bit of a more refined uh, set of, of tasks, but it corresponds to these three ones. There is a notion of a manual task, it has a hand icon. There is a notion of a user task, this is a, a little person icon. By default, in most big business process management systems, this will be the default type of task. When you throw in something, it will be assumed it is a user task, okay? If you want to make a manual task, you have to explicitly make it. If you want to make an automated task, you have to explicitly make it. And then there are automated tasks. And in BPMN, which is like based on consensus of what exists in existing business process management systems, uh, four types of automated tasks are distinguished. There is one that just sends a message to a system, right? Like, for example, I want to notify uh, the customer that we are rejecting their insurance claim or whatever by sending them a standard letter filled in with some details. I can automate that task with a send task. I send a message, that's it, as far as sending the, 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 sending the, the message is concerned. And maybe there might be some other stuff happening later, like the, the, the customer wants to complain or something like that. But if I consider that my task is just to send, this can be fully automated, and it's a type of automated task in BPMN. And the dual of that, which is receiving something. So you are in a part of a process where you are waiting for input from the customer. Like, for example, uh, the customer has to choose uh, whether they want their product in red or in green. You know? So you are expecting a message from the customer. And it doesn't matter how that message comes. It can come you know, through, through an email. It can come through some... Uh, a, a, external web service call, it doesn't matter, but you're just expecting a message from the user. Right? So this is a receive task. Uh, and then there are essentially two other types of automated tasks. One is like a service task that comes from the nomenclature of web services. In a way, it's an RPC-style task, where you will make a query, for example, to a system, send a request to a system to record something. Like, for example, you will send a request to uh, the banking system to make a wire transfer, and you expect back a response, which can be a positive response. Yes, we confirm that the uh, wire transfer order has been received, or it could be an exception. Yeah, like for example, uh, the, the details, the, the, the account number does not match the beneficiary name, uh, and therefore we cannot make the transfer. So, so that's what we call a service task. It's, it's sort of a RPC, a remote procedure call abstraction. Uh, and then there is a notion of a script task. So, by the way, this is also used uh, when you want the process to um, communicate with uh, other applications. Like, for example, I have the application that will automate the process, and I have to record stuff in my enterprise resource planning system, say my subsystem. Uh, or I want to record something in my uh, SharePoint system, or I want to record something in my Salesforce system. Whatever you are using as a CRM, as an ERP, um, as a collaboration tool, and that you need to send data to it, you will use a service task. In fact, most ERP systems nowadays have become, in a way, service-oriented in their underlying architecture. Like, since you take the SAP system, nowadays almost the full functionality exists both through uh, uh, a, 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 a large number of, of services, and and if you you know uh, want to record, for example, a vacation request in the system in the SAP system, there will be a specific uh, web service operation for that. You know, if you want to record a purchase order, there is a specific web service operation for that. So so you can develop your uh, business process automation application independently of the ERP system. And then every time you have to record something in the ERP system, you will just make a service task. So you have to be executed process models full of these service tasks. And then finally, there are script tasks, which are tasks that do not necessarily require communication with external systems. Uh, but it requires some uh, computation or it requires some uh, series of steps to be performed within the process-oriented application. Typical of that will be a calculation of 
an entitlement, for example, if you know very well what the entitlement rules will be uh, in the case of the insurance handling stuff. So, but typically without communication to external applications. Um, although some people might, some developers might want to use the script task in case you want to do something weird like um, um, throwing something into an FTP server or um, throwing a message into a JMS queue, etc., where it doesn't fit the template of the service task. So I will take uh, this um, a, a process and we will start looking what is automated, what is manual, etc. So here we see that uh, check stock availability is something that can be automated. We have as input a purchase order that we assume it's received in some uh, electronic format and we can take the details of the products, look for them in the catalog and determine if they are available or not available, um, check if the materials are available uh, in the warehouse in case the finished product is not available, that's something that we can automate. Um, uh, manufacturing the product, if we assume that manufacture, as far as my process is concerned, manufacturing the product means uh, requesting the manufacturer scheduling the production of the product in the manufacturing system, then I can turn it into a service task, for example. So you see, um, automated doesn't mean that on the back there is no physical work. It just means that from the perspective of your process, the requirements of the tasks can be automated. If I assume that the requirements of manufacturing the product from the perspective of this application is to schedule the production of my products in the uh, manufacturing system, uh, then this is a perfectly automatable task. Right. Now, in the manufacturing system, somebody will have to figure out what to do when I receive a production order, right? Okay, you know, some engineer will have to look at it, you know, uh, schedule it. Uh, somebody will have to actually, you know, put it into the, the assembly line. Some people will have to do work. Someone will have to record that the product has been uh, finished, etc. But uh, as far as this uh, a process is concerned, I can consider that my, my requirement is just to tell the production system that the product has to be manufactured. There are some uh, uh, manual uh, message tasks here that are automated, like sending a message to the supplier to request them to ship us some raw materials. That is uh, a send task and therefore is perfectly uh, automatable. Um, now, something that cannot be automated, that is a very manual, is retrieving the products from the warehouse. If I assume that I am in a warehouse where things uh, are not uh, a, a automated, not like the one, nowadays there are these modern, fully automated, robotized warehouses, you know, but let's assume these are people going and picking things from the warehouse. That's, that's at first glance something that I cannot really automate, and it's <coughs> not like someone sitting uh, somewhere reading data and entering something. It's not like a purely digital task. And the same, uh, when I receive the raw materials from the supplier in the warehouse and I have to put them where the manufacturing department needs them, that's also a manual task. It involves somebody receiving boxes and putting them in the right place. Uh, and then if I keep going, you know, confirming the order to the customer that could be a manual task is like a sales manager looking uh, at the data of the order, seeing that yes, we can deliver it at this time, and uh, 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 perhaps communicating this to the customer, uh, and so on. So, what we end up after this is with uh, an annotated process model where the tasks have annotation that tells us whether they are um, automated tasks, in this, that case, whether they are service tasks, send tasks, receive tasks, or script tasks. Uh, whether the task is a user task, in which case we know we have to provide, interact with the user. And then we have this nasty manual task, and I do not know what to do with them a priori in my uh, process, when I automate the process. In the executable process more, I don't, do, I don't know what to do because I don't have a hook to those tasks. So we somehow have to figure out if we can hook the manual task to the process, that's option number one, one way or another. Uh, or we want to throw away the manual task out of the 
scope of my application. So either I find a way of getting enough data from the manual task in my process application, process automation application, to uh, determine when the task is completed, or I'll have to say, this is invisible to me, and I'll probably have to then split my process into two and leave the manual part outside the scope of my process. Those are the two things you can do. So, for example, if I have this task retrieved product from warehouse, and in the current way the process envisage, this will go someone going and picking a product and putting it in a special shipment bay, right? Uh, that is a manual task so far. And, and I want to turn it into an, a user task in the sense that someone will enter data into the system. How do I do that? What is the standard trick for turning a physical task involving movement into a, an, a, ta a user task, not an automated task, because there will still be someone moving around, but uh, an automated, uh, a user task where someone enters data. Material no. order. Yeah, tracking technology is called. Cool. So, and there's many types of tracking technology, barcodes and QR codes nowadays. Um, RFID uh, as well, right? Uh, so we will turn into something where um, someone will have to, uh, at least in the in the shipment bay, when things are put into that, someone will have to scan something, which means somewhere else uh, the 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 code of that product need to be recorded in my system. So I probably need to even split this task into two. One where I assign a unique code to, to the order and uh, then produce the QR code, the label with the QR code with the barcode, uh, and, that, and then someone going and attaching that to the product that is going to be uh, retrieved from the warehouse, going and attaching that. Then something manual is going to happen. So there is a moment where I produce the label. That label is given to, to a worker. The worker will attach it to the box at some point in time. Then I don't see what's going on there. The next thing I see from the perspective of my system is that there is a, a, an event where the, that label has been scanned from a box in the shipment bay, you know, in the barcode reader of the shipment bay, or replaced barcode reader by RFID and the barcode by the RFID tag. And it's pretty much the same. So, so a tag is put into a pallet, for example, and when things go out of the warehouse, there is an RFID reader that detects that, well, this ha thing has gone into the, the shipment bay. Right. Uh, so, so we will have to replace this into two parts, something where I, um, I make it, I notify that to, uh, to workers in the warehouse that this product with this label has to, this product has to be retrieved <coughs> and this label has to be attached to it. And then they do it. And then the next thing is when that label is bar scanned in the achievement bay, and then I know that that task has happened. So in this case, I replaced the manual task by uh, one uh, receive send task. I send something to, in this case, the, 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 the warehouse people and a receive task. And how do I do this? I have not yet specified. How do I notify the people? Do I, every time that I have an order, uh, send an email or push an item into the work list of people with a copy of that label they have to print and put into the product? You know, uh, or uh, do I do it in bulk and I send these are the orders of today and here are the corresponding labels that will come up later? Or if we cannot uh, uh, track the, the manual task. This is called like, tracking the task. Huh? We are not automating the task in any way, we are just tracking the task. If I cannot track the manual task, I will have to um, uh, isolate the manual task and automate the rest and leave that manual task out. Uh, and the standard trick for that will be, for example, here I have a, an application uh, 
a process for handling university admissions. And there is a point where there's a lot of checks being done on the application, submitted electronically. Uh, and at some point in time, this is batched and sent for assessment to a committee. Right. Uh, and let me assume that things are such, you know, that this committee is not supported by an electronic system, so we're going to be working with paper on here. Right. Let me assume for a moment that. And let me assume that as a, as a system analyst, I have tried by all means to figure out if we can modify the process to uh, make assess application uh, an automated uh, user task, but I have not managed. Right? So I give up as a business and a system analyst on trying to force this manual task to become an automated task. And that's a trade-off you have to do as a system analyst every so often, right? You will never win all your automation wars. Automation is for two reasons. One, because automation might not be economically viable. The benefits of automation might outweigh the cost of putting in place the automation solution. That's one, one option. Or the second option is that you have political barriers. People want to work the way they have always worked, right? And there is no way you, external to that particular business unit, will manage to convince people to do what they do not want to do, right? For example, I try to convince you to do your homework from time to time in advance, but I haven't figured it out, right? So, see, I have to admit, you know, you guys are a bunch of manual tasks, and I can do nothing with you <laughs> other than tracking that you have submitted. Right, what happens in the middle, in between the deadline and before, when I give the homework and the deadline is completely visible. Okay, so we have given up on trying to automate this task. So the standard trick there is to cut the process here and here. This part is like black boxed, I don't see it, right? And I rather try to automate the other segments. The segment before, I try to automate the segment before, and I try to automate the segment after. Right. Uh, right. And, and out of this big uh, set of all manual tasks, maybe all that I have uh, is an event that tells me that the replication results are available. <laughs> Wow. I know you guys are so concentrated. Don't worry. No stress, no stress, no stress, no stress. You are, you are imagining, oh my god, I have to do all that for the next homework and for the project and in the exam, you know, how am I going to do all this, you know, get stressed and break the chairs. <laughs> so, so I will say this is a process I will automate, the process where applications are handled electronically. Then there is a black box I will not automate, which is like uh, how applications are assessed by the committee. It's a bunch of 60-year-old people, I will not convince them to, you know, start using some sophisticated system. And actually, maybe the benefits of using the system outweigh the cost and they are higher than the cost. Um, and then I will automate this part, which is when uh, the decisions have been made, results are available back in the, in the, in the admissions office, and uh, we will uh, record the acceptance of the application and notify to the student that they have been accepted. So, two tricks. In essence, so let me take a quick example to make you wake up a little bit. So, so you know this prescription fulfillment process, right? Uh, we have a, a prescription that arrives, and in the to be process, uh, we first do the insurance check, right? Uh, a, and uh, after the insurance check, a technician, so if the insurance check is passed, uh, and we know how much the insurance will pay and how much the customer will pay. A technician is assigned to go and collect the drugs uh, for a particular prescription from uh, the, the back room, right? And uh, they put them in a bag and they attach the prescription to it, they staple it. And after that, the bag goes somewhere to a pharmacist. <coughs> and the pharmacist starts checking 
you know, whether everything is fine, <coughs> whether they can detect some problem. And that's by law, the pharmacy has to check at some point in time that the prescriptions are being filled correctly. And uh, sometimes the pharmacist will just send back the bag to the, to the technician and say, you know, there's a problem, fix it. Or sometimes they will say, this is all fine, and we'll put it in the pickup area. Right. And then eventually the customer arrives, and there is a bunch of bags in the pickup area, and the technician goes and sees if the one of the customer is there. And if it's not there, say, sorry, it's not there, let me figure out where it is. If it is, then mm -hmm. uh, it, the technician gives it to the, to the customer, and the customer will, will, will pay, it will be a transaction for the payment happening there. So, which tasks, uh, question is, which tasks are user tasks, which tasks are automated tasks, which tasks are manual tasks? Okay, first task. Yeah, the first type is to... Um, yeah, to the insurance check. Insurance check. Okay, there is the insurance check. That, uh, we start with the insurance check. Okay, check insurance. And then we collect the drugs from the shelves. Right? And then, uh, a, that's what the technician does. And then the pharmacist will check uh, the quality of the drugs. And then... No. Seal the bag and put it in the pickup area. And then the technician, the customer arrives and <coughs> the technician picks up the bag from the prescription, from the pickup area and collects the payment. Check insurance, what type of task would that be? It's an automated task. You know, you can, you can think you will connect uh, to the, to the a insurance broker that will check if the the, the task the, the customer is insured or not, give the customer details. So automated task. Collecting the drugs on the shelves in this to be process model at the moment is a manual task. Checking the quality at the moment is a manual task. Sealing the bag, uh, putting it in the pickup area is a manual task. Uh, Retrieving the prescription bag when the customer arrives and say, okay, this is my name, and I go and look at the prescription bag, is a manual task. And uh, collecting the payment, let's say, at the moment, is also a manual task, although it might be a user task. It depends on how exactly it looks like. So this might be a, a, a user task. And if it's not a user task, it's something you can turn into a user task. So how do we deal with this manual task in this process? What would be the standard technique to, to, to prepare this process for automation? Identify what, what else can be automated to fill the gaps or, 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 take, a, uh, or take out of this the, the manual, most of the manual as, as much as we can. Let's start by one of them. Yeah. Which one? Collect drugs. This can collect collect drugs into user task. That can be turned into either a user task or the same trick we did before, like order the collection of the drugs and record that the drugs have been collected. One of the two, right? Let me say that I'll make it a, a user task. But the idea will be that um, the prerequisite here will be that I will, when when the customer when the order arrives. I will, ass I will create a unique label, barcode or QR code, for that order, and we will attach it to the, to the physical object, in this case, the bag, right? So we'll attach it to the bag. So the, the technician will start by getting a label for the order, taking a bag and attaching it, and doing a first scan to say, I am collecting the drugs, right, for this prescription. This is, this is the, 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 the bag for this prescription. And then the second part of the step, the task is is to scan the bag that the bag is complete. So so to do another scan of the bag and type C 
to say this this uh, bag has been collected, this order has been collected. Now the system knows that this order has been collected. So this task has become a manual task insofar as the use the the you the system gives data to the user, in this case the label, the barcode label, mm -hmm. and something happens, the user does work and the user then records that the task is completed. Now you see that in a, there is a typical pattern in that that you have to find an event for the start and an event for the end. We call this to check out the task, and we call this one to check in the task. And that's what a manual task is. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a checkout event where you provide data to the user that they need, <clears throat> eventually followed by a check-in event where you say the task has been completed. Every time that you take a process which is currently manual and you want to automate it, you have to identify what's task and what could be the check-in event and the check-out event. If you succeed, it means that manual task can be turned into um, a user task or, a, or an automated task, depending on the level of automation you achieve. And if you do not succeed, that means that we have to cut the process into two. Check quality. How do I turn into a manual task now, into a user task? Check the labels. Exactly. The pharmacist will take a bag, We'll scan it, check it, and mark it's done, right? Completed, okay? Or we'll scan it again to say it's completed, depending on how what the conventions are. So I can turn that into a manual task. Now, the customer arrives to the counter, and uh, we want to collect, seal the bag, and, uh, uh, sorry, no, no, we are not yet there. We check the quality. Uh, and then we seal the bag and put it in the pickup area. How do we turn it into a manual task? Into a user task? This one doesn't make sense in a way. You, we remove it. It doesn't make sense. Because it's like, okay, the, the, the pharmacist scans when they put in the pickup area and that signals that it's, it's, uh, the task is, is done. So mm -hmm. I, will, I will throw that task out of the to be executed model. It's, it still exists in the to be model, possibly. When the to be executed model, this goes out. This is a task we do not see. What we see is that the bag has passed the quality check and we assume it has been put in the pickup area. That's a matter of practice. And then now the customer arrives and they ask for their bag, and given the customer name or the or the phone number or um, whatever a barcode we gave to them, uh, bar tag we gave to them when they arrived to drop off their prescription, based on that we can determine if the bag is ready. Okay, so we check in on this task to determine the bag is ready. If it is ready, we can know, for example, in which shelf it has been put. We can go and pick it up, and then uh, a, the fact that we're scanning on the on the task on the bag on the prescription uh, signals that we have uh, performed the task, right? So um, I wouldn't agree too much that you eliminate it. You turn it into a, a, a user task. The user arrives, we scan, so it's a single event, and uh, and we retrieve the order to signal that. And then we are, are ready to, to collect the payment. And, and then you can think of this as being a manual task. If you know, it's still the, 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 the technician has to uh, transfer data to the, to the payment station, to the, the, car, the ATM car station, uh, or uh, a, it might be a, even automated that the system sends it to the, the, the card reader and the customer can enter their credit card, debit card to pay. So depending on what level of automation you can achieve, this will become a user task or a manual task. So then we get pretty much this process. Uh, we check the insurance, we collect the drug from the shelf, we check the quality, and uh, the next thing is like, boom, we, uh, we collect the payment. You know, whether this is a manual task or an automated task, it will depend on what level of automation you can achieve. So we started from from something, and we ended up in something quite different. You know, more refined, less tasks in some cases. 
in some other cases we're not going to act as, but we are going to rather merge or split. Um, so that was the second step. The second step which consisted in uh, determining the automation boundaries, you know, what parts of the process will be automated and which parts will not. The third step in the process is to complete the, the, the process model. It, it turns out that when you are doing conceptual process model for the sake of producing models that are understandable and that where you can focus on the important parts of the process, you tend to ignore uh, a path exceptions in the sense of paths that are very infrequent. Now, if you are going to automate something, of course, you have to somehow take care of these paths one way or another. If they are extremely infrequent, you have to provide workarounds for people to deal with them. Uh, if they are not too infrequent, you might want to actually integrate the handling of the exceptions into the process itself. Uh, so we have to consider, find out exceptions in the process, in the 2B process model, and de determine what, how we are going to handle those exceptions. <coughs> uh, and how to, how to find exceptions in a process. There are some rules of thumb. The first one is that every, every time you send something, something can go wrong. Okay? Um, if you send something to a, a system, you know, through a service task or through a send task, or to a supplier, to an external party, or to the customer, you have always to ask yourself, what happens if they do not respond to you? <coughs> what happens if the response comes too late? You know, you wait. How long are you going to wait for it? And if you, the time expires, what are you going to do? And uh, if the message arrives after the deadline has expired, what would you do with that message? So these are standard questions to ask. And what happens if they do not respond to you what you expect? You know, what, in other words, what, um, what kind of alternative messages can you get back when you send a message? So these are the, the three questions you need to be asking yourself and that will determine how do you need to extend the process to deal with exceptions related to sending the task. So obviously, for every task, you have to uh, a user task. You have to talk to the um, performers of that task and gather requirements as to what can be the exceptional cases where that task cannot be performed. You know, they are given the task, in which cases they are not able to perform the task. Uh, they need to abort it in some way, and what needs to be done in those cases. So that's an analysis that needs to be done with the performance of the process. And uh, uh, the other analysis, which is the reverse of the first one, is uh, what else... I have some receive tasks in my process where I can receive data from my partners. I need to, to determine what other messages they might want to send to me. And the standard method to determine that is crude analysis. So you determine what objects are involved in the process. Like, for example, if I am dealing with purchase orders, I send out purchase orders, uh, or I send out requests for quotations, or uh, I send out uh, uh, invoices, right? I need to always think uh, what crude operations I need to provide to my external parties on those objects. So if I send an invoice, do I need to provide a way for the customers to be able to view the invoice at any point in time? Do I need to provide them a way to request the invoice to be updated? Do I need to provide them a way to request that the invoice be canceled? Okay. So all these operations, you know, I need to, to uh, identify them. And, and the best way to do that, I mean, a very kind of systematic way to do that, is to identify what are the business objects in your, in, that are manipulated in your process, and for each of them, uh, to, 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 and for each party that might have access to that data, to determine whether they can create, read, update, delete, and what kind of updates they can do. Is it like they can really update, or is it like they can request for an update? Can they really cancel it, delete it, or can they request for it to be canceled or deleted? Uh, and by doing that analysis, I determine what additional operations my system needs to provide to external parties to be able to manipulate the objects that are flowing around in the process. And uh, a related to that, I need to specify, of course, what business objects I need 
uh, in my process what, what electronic business objects I need, and for each of them, I need to determine uh, a where, when and who creates them, when and who reads them, when and who updates them, when and who deletes them. Uh, and for every gateway decision point in my XOR decision point in my process, I need to determine which objects this decision point needs in order to evaluate, determine whether you have to go left or right. Uh, in our example, for example, we start with a 2B process model like that, and then we start asking ourselves, um, uh, we check raw materials, check raw materials availability, right? What can go wrong there? Obviously, that the materials are not available. You know, there's no way to obtain those materials on time to ship the customer. Therefore, you will add, let's say, an exception, an error event that can happen here, and it call materials unavailable, and in that case, you will have to notify the customer, and maybe you have to mark the purchase order as canceled, and so on. Uh, uh, when I uh, uh, check stock availability, I give it a simple a purchase order. It consults the warehouse database, the, the catalog, or the, sorry, yeah, the, the inventory database, and it will produce to me some object that tells me, oh, this, this product for, for every line item in my order, this product is available in this amount, this product is available in this amount, this product is available in that amount. Um, when I consult, perform the task, check raw materials availability, I will get as output some listing that tells me this raw material is available in this amount, this raw material is available in this amount, and so on. And more generally, every task will have, uh, will need to have, every task in your process, I'll just put it back, every task in the process will need to have an input, a clear input, and if there is a relevant output that is used elsewhere in the process, it will have an output. And this way you are going to sort of this is going to give you the, the, the scope for uh, a implementing each task. Yes? That's the third thing. So, so complete the process by documenting all your data objects, inputs and outputs, and all the exceptions that can happen in different parts of the process. Um, so we were at um, determining the, the automation scope. Um, uh, the data, uh, completing the process with data, objects, and exceptions, and the third, the, the fourth thing to com to finish with the to be executed process model is to adjust task granularity. Uh, this is something you saw with Pyman last week. That sometimes you might have in your process model two consecutive tasks, uh, and they, but in in terms of automating the thing, they are essentially the same. If two consecutive tasks are performed by the same performer, same person, in a single goal, in a single unit of work, you probably want to put them together. Even though in your to be process model maybe they were separate. Uh, so for example, if I have a process like this one, I call this salami processes. And, and this is a, a real case produced by uh, your predecessors in previous year. Uh, Enter the customer name, enter the customer policy number, enter the damage details. You will say, well, why don't we enter the claim right away, right? So because if this is done by the same uh, clerk, there's no point in having them split. So we're going to replace them by a single task. A task, remember, has to have the granularity that a person does it. It's, they start it, they finish it. A single person. Starting and finishing in a single goal. So don't start like splitting your process into salami tasks like oh do this, do that, enter the customer name, enter the customer details, etc. Like, your your automation will become a nightmare. The more tasks you have, the more you have to automate, and then uh, the more you will then force the user to click, 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 click to go through all those tasks. And the opposite is that sometimes you might have tasks in the two big process more like enter and approve money transfer that in fact require different performers, like entering the money transfer would, has to be done by one person, approving the money transfer is done by another person who has suitable authority, appropriate authority to approve. So in that case, because this is actually a task that involves two people, two different people, I will split it into two different tasks. And try to get to the point where every user task uh, is assigned to a performer 
the next task is assigned to a different performer, the previous task is assigned to a different performer. So, so then it's very clear that transfers between one task and another are also transfers from one performer to another performer. Right. There is an exception to the rule is when there is um, a there is a task that needs to be there are two tasks, they have they are consecutive, they have to be performed by the same performer, but there is a necessary empty time between them, you know, silent time between them. Like for example, you post the documents to some external agency. This is the clerk or the admissions officer in the admissions office, and uh, uh, days pass, and eventually uh, uh, we got back the, those results from the agency and we record, we upload them into the system. You know, I upload them into our uh, document management system. So, so there was an empty time in between this task and this task. They cannot be performed in a single go. Right. And then you might have a case where two consecutive tasks have the same performer, same person, same clerk, uh, but you will keep them separate. You will not merge them together because this, that, that, the empty time in between will be lost. Question? Yeah. Uh, but uh, the second and the third, can they be joined together? Uh, yeah. But should, it, should they? No, no, I think, uh, yeah, if they are the same performer. So one thing will be that there is a scenario where you receive it, you pull it into a document management system, and uh, later, you know, but, uh, why would later? It would have to be a different person then updating the student record. Well, if the same person who is uploading to the document management system is the one who has to update the student records with the information that came back, came back in the document, then they, they, these two tasks will be done together. So, so we try really to get to the point where two consecutive tasks by the same performer are merged into the same task unless there is a necessary uh, empty time, uh, you know, silent time between the two, <coughs> where that is uncompressible, you cannot remove, incompressible, you cannot remove it. This, this is an incompressible silent time in the middle. So, um, so you see that sometimes you, you merge tasks and sometimes you might have to split tasks because the, the people who, uh, the business analysts when they did their, their 2 b process models, well, they just saw that enter and approving a model transfer is something that needs to be done here. I didn't really care as to whether it was one person or two persons and whatever. They just put it there. So sometimes you have to split tasks, but sometimes you have to merge tasks. Sometimes you have to add stuff to deal with exceptions. Sometimes you have to add data objects. Um, sometimes you have to remove manual tasks because you didn't find any way to turn them into user tasks or into automated tasks. So your uh, after these four steps that I just went through, your 2B process model, you started with a 2B process model like this one, and you end up with something completely different, typically uh, larger because of maybe because of all the data objects that you start adding and all the exception handlers that you start adding. Uh, a lot of, of timers here, for example, that were not there. Or uh, these are compensation events that are similar to error events. Uh, this was simply. Uh, ability to cancel the order, which was not contemplated in the 2B process model. No? Uh, and uh, even like when you cancel an order, you first, the customer request cancellation, that request is examined, and then uh, you might uh, uh, <coughs> notify the customer, yes, you can cancel, but it costs you a certain penalty or not, and then you, you, you have to uh, wait for a response for the customer. When you wait for a response to the customer, it might be that they do not respond, or that they do not respond within, say, uh, three business days. Maybe you have to send a reminder to the customer, etc. So you start entering into all these details that add uh, a complicatedness into your into your process. And there we have a to be executed process model. And finally, we can start doing. Uh, what we like to do as IT people. So the ordeal is finished. Or it started, depending on whether you like to deal with uh, bugs, things that don't work, 
trials and errors, exception, and long hours in front of your computer trying to figure out how to solve something, which is where we get. Step five is to specify the execution property, which makes the to breathing executability into the 2B process model. So now you have a 2B process model, right? It's still, BPMN is purely diagrammatic. There is pretty much nothing inside there that is not visualized here. And now what we're going to do is something that is now invisible in BPMN. You don't see it in the diagram. We're going to take each of these tasks and we're going to add what we call execution properties to it that will determine how that task needs to be performed. And each data object too, we're going to type each data object and we're going to, to, to capture its schema. Right. So what we need to do is, first of all, turn the data objects that need to be manipulated inside the process into variables of a certain data type. You know, for example, the purchase order, there will be a purchase order type for it. We have to specify, oh, that purchase order type, what does it have? Well, it has a a customer name, it has a purchase order ID, it has a list of line items. Well, what does a line item have? Well, a line item has a, a product ID, has an amount that has a total to be paid, you know, or a cost per unit and a total, and so on. Uh, so we have to specify process variables, and related to that, we also, whenever we receive messages from outside, we need to specify what's the data type of those messages, and the same when we send uh, messages outside and the same when there are errors that carry data with them. We need to specify, um, a, you, you see how this works, is that, that the process has a memory that consists of variables, that's typically what happens, and every task has inputs and outputs. And every time you start a task, you need to provide inputs, and when it completes, you need to take the outputs and record them in the <coughs> process variables. So you need to provide mappings from the process variables to the task variables. And from the task variables, the output of the task, you need to provide mappings to the process variables to record the SQL outputs. For every uh, service task, you need to specify what service are you calling, where is it located, is it rest, is it so? If it's so, where is the window? If it's window, then where is the port number, where is it deployed, etc. What are the data types inside, etc. And, uh, and then also you have to specify these mappings between the process variables and the, and the inputs and outputs of the services. If you have a script task, you have to write code snippets. Yes, you have to code. Uh, if, you, uh, if you have a user task, you need to specify who, how will we determine at runtime who has to perform this task. And it could be as simple as saying, well, any curl can do it. But then sometimes it gets a bit more complicated. Well, it can be uh, any clerk, but uh, a, this one give it to a most experienced one. Or it can be any clerk, but it has to be the same clerk who did these other tasks three days ago. And sometimes you have the opposite. You have to say like, well, a purchase order, uh, should, a purchase requisition should be approved by a person different from the one who created it, right? Makes sense, four eyes principle. So then you have to specify a rule that tells you like, any manager can approve this order, <coughs> except the one who started the order three days ago, right? So, so these things are called participant allocation rules or participant assignment rules. Um, and for every um, decision gateway, you have to specify the expressions that go left and right. Until now, we have been writing it in English, right? You might have guessed that was not executable. Um, and, uh, and then there are a lot of things that are specific to the BPMS, meaning they are not covered in the BPMS standard. You have to specify there are notions of work queues, there are notions of forms, uh, there are connectors to Oracle databases, there are connectors to Sybase databases, um, there are uh, connectors for en electronic data interchange, EDI systems, uh, etc. that need to be specified in some cases that are specific to uh, a, every BPMS you are working with and the set of systems to which the BPMS needs to connect. So they are specific to your enterprise architecture. So it's a lot. Right. So uh, we need to step back a little bit and see, like try to conceptualize what we need so that you, you have 
what I want you is to have a very clear picture, like I have this process and I need to make it executable. Where do I start? What do I have to do? What do I have to think about? You know, how do I make sure I didn't forget something? So the first thing is to understand how, what this monster on which you are going to deploy called the business process management system, how does it look like? So any business process management system pretty much has more or less this high level architecture. There is a process modeling tool. Uh, you know, like besides the process model you have been using, you can draw BPMN models on top of that. You can draw conceptual process models, you can draw it to be executed process models. That's what you're going to have your to be executed process models. Typically, these things have also functionality to save uh, the process model in a repository, or some of them are software as a service based and you know, style of, in the style of Google Docs, and they will save automatically. Uh, then, process model comes out of it with all its execution properties and is deployed into an execution engine. And the execution engine takes as input fully executable process models and starts, in essence, interpreting them, just like the JVM interprets bytecode. Right? It starts interpreting them, saying, like, okay, what do I need to do? Ah, I need to wait for a purchase order. Okay, let's wait for it. Oh, now it's there. Okay, I mark it that it has been done. What do I do next? What do I do next? What expressions I have to evaluate? What code snippets I have to run? What services I have to call, etc. So, so the execution engine is doing that. Whenever there are user tasks, then the execution engine cannot completely automate the execution. So if it's like a service task, I make a service, I receive, the, I receive things back, I, I, I look at what came back, and I determine what to do next. And this is a user task. I, I need to give something to a user and wait. Okay. Uh, and the standard way to do that is to uh, have a, a, a notion of a work list handler part of the system that is responsible for managing queues of works to the user. Uh, and uh, these queues might take very different forms. It might be, in some cases, Outlook tasks. You know, have you used Outlook Exchange in a company? You know, you, you have Outlook and then the tasks that you have to perform are in a special uh, kind of inbox with all the tasks you have to do and you can mark them as complete, etc. You can, have, you can connect to a task tracking system that essentially maintains work lists. Um, a, the study information system is a system with a lot of work lists. Now, I, I don't know you guys, but I get like, well, I have to write this exam protocol, I have to write that exam protocol, I have to uh, a, a, a register a, the syllabus, I have to uh, create a course offering for next semester, etc. There are a bunch of, of tasks for me to do in that system. So, and most information systems will have like desktops or work lists with tasks that every person has to do. So, those things are called work list handlers. And a business person managing the system will typically provide special components for managing those work lists, or else it provides connectors to connect, for example, to a SharePoint system to manage work, work lists in there. And uh, a final component is the administration tool that allows an administrator of the business process to look at which process instances are being executed, which tasks are being executed, what has been completed, what has not been completed, and to, to manipulate the process if they need to, for example, reallocate the task to someone, etc. All the administration functions. And when you have something like a send task or a receive task or a um, or a service task, then the execution engine has to connect to external applications exposed, for example, as services. And this is typically how it looks like. Uh, so I can take any uh, business process management system, so there's like dozens of them, and I can start looking at, you know, can tell you what would there be. I mean, I can open any one like that and tell you, well, First thing, there will be a process modeling tool. This is, for example, the process modeling tool of uh, a Bonita Soft. Bonita is an open source uh, business process management system, quite popular actually. Uh, and uh, and you will have like a standard BPMN palette on there that you are uh, uh, aware of those ones. Uh, and then they have these uh, uh, types of uh, uh, panel views. Uh, where if you open a task, you can enter all the details about it. You know what are the, the type of the objects 
data objects that this task takes as input or as output, etc. The same thing for uh, this is IBM Business Process Manager. IBM Business Process Manager is one of the, let's say, most complete, uh, larger uh, uh, business process management systems around. And you can take a task, you can open it, and you will see uh, uh, all the data mappings that you can define in there, data types, what the task takes as input, what it takes as outputs, per, uh, resource allocation, uh, performer allocation rules, and so on. Then every system will have an execution engine. Uh, of course, and it will have a work list handler. Uh, this will be, for example, the default work list handler of Bonita Soft. Of course, you can change the, the layout if you want, but roughly it will always look like that. There are tasks that, uh, this is what a user sees. He sees tasks, he can click on them, and he can see the details of the tasks, and he can mark the task as done or, you know, to be done. He can reassign the task to some other worker and it will appear in the work list of the other person, etc. And there is an administration, a monitoring tool, where you have, uh, uh, on the one hand, tools to see uh, what uh, what is the current status of open tasks, tasks that have not been performed, you know, who uh, uh, has been assigned how many tasks, you know, I can see the length of the queues of different people in the organization, how many tasks are late, how many tasks are on time, etc. Assuming that I have specified in my process model the duration, expected duration of tasks. And then there are all, uh, these products offer also a bunch of uh, a, a administration uh, tools, you know, where you can, you know, see what work people are performing, take away tasks from one person to another, etc. And also monitoring tools where you can see the performance of the process average execution times, etc. We'll see more about this uh, when we get into process monitoring down the road. And, and this is quite important because um, sometimes um, students ask me, so, so what is the, <coughs> can I do my project in PHP? You know, I know, you all love PHP. It's great, you know, we all love PHP, I love PHP. Uh, and I say, um, at the beginning, I said yes. What a mistake, because I understood that um, that the problem was that um, there was a very narrow perception of what an automated business process solution should do. And it's like an automated business process solution should essentially uh, there are tasks, and for every task, I spit out a form with a submit button. The user enters something, submits the button, and then I record that it has been submitted. And then that determines which other tasks need to be performed. I spit out a form and I record that it has been submitted. Well, I say that, that sounds to me like a typical, you know, uh, kindergarten level PHP application. Right. Right. So this nowadays, you know, that in Estonia people, the kids are taught programming, you know, in Python from first year, from uh, a first year of school. That's the myth. So they will be able to do this application. So, so why do I need a business process management system? Well, it's because a business process management system offers you a whole range of functionality, for example, for resource allocation, where you can manipulate that this is like uh, a managers actually viewing the work list of people, <coughs> manipulating, reassigning work to rebalance things, uh, setting up an alert you know, that I receive an SMS whenever I have more than 10% of my tasks late, right? So, so all this kind of alerting system, uh, all this system that allows managers to control what is going on, that allows process participants to reassign work to one another, uh, that allows someone, when the customer calls, to know exactly where their case is located at the moment, right? Uh, oh, you want to know where your prescription is? Oh, it's currently being quality checked. It will be ready in 10 minutes, right? Um, and all these dashboards to know how the process has been performed in the last week, in the last month, in the last three months, etc. So, um, uh, if you you wanted to develop an, a, a process automation solution from scratch, which is perfectly possible, great. But never forget that you will also have requirements not only related to task performance, which form do I spit and with what fields in order to perform a user task. This is just 
one tiny bit of your solution. There will be a whole bunch of requirements for being able to administer the tasks in the process, the performance, reallocate work, someone is ill, you know, how do we replace them, etc. All these, the system will have to support all these management functionality and all the analytics functionality to determine how my process has been performed in the last months, in the last three months, uh, where are my bottlenecks in the process, etc. Right? Uh, assessing the performance of every individual participant in the process, determining, you know, who is underperforming, is, who is uh, a, outperforming others, etc. So, so that all that are additional requirements that you have into your in your uh, automation uh, solution. Uh, and so, so this is one of the reasons why business process management systems kind of, in a way, can speed up development. If these requirements are important to you, I tell people, like, if, if these requirements are not important to you, if all that you want is really a system that spits forms and, and people complete it and you mark that this task has been done, then fine, you don't need a BPMS. If you're not going to use all this functionality, you don't need a BPMS. Um, and of course, another thing BPMS gives you, but nowadays any programming language will, will give you that too, is the ability to easily uh, hook external services into your application. Uh, and the richness of some BPMS systems is that they will have connectors to all sorts of different systems, you know, connectors to Salesforce, connectors to SAP, connectors to Oracle Finance, etc. There are many, many different business process management systems. Um, and uh, uh, there are some that come from big vendors, so these are very complete, but also very heavy, heavyweight solutions. Uh, the IBM BPM being one of them, one that has been around for, for has been developed after many iterations uh, and has very rich functionality. <coughs> uh, Oracle has a solution, the Oracle Business Process Management System. Microsoft traditionally has two even, one in this like large enterprise application development tools called Bistalk, and another one uh, embedded in the system more for programmatic use called Windows Workflow Foundation. Uh, SAP has its own solution as well, but usually it's used to implement uh, processes tightly connected to SAP systems, of course. Um, a, another German company, Software AG, has another system called Web Methods. This is you know, pretty widely used. There are even installations of this being maintained in Estonia as we speak, uh, and so on. Uh, there are other, lots of other vendors uh, that have different solutions. We're going to be using this Visage VPN suite um, simply because I find it offers the right trade-off, a certain trade-off between being sufficiently large that you can get to see all the range of features that a BPMS provides, but not too large that merely installing the thing will cost you a 10 days headache. Right? So it's like somewhere in between. Uh, although sometimes installing the thing will cost you a headache, I am aware. Uh, and there are commercial, there are open source ones, but open source in the sense of commercial, like Bonita Soft, etc., which are quite interesting uh, alternatives to this one. And there are some like community open source things which are not uh, uh, very like commercially supported, let's say. And uh, when you're going to sit and use one of these solutions, I recommend you to keep this cheat sheet in mind. Uh, uh, when you are going to specify the execution properties, you have to do it in three. You have three things that you have to remember. First, you have to remember to specify for every XOR gateway, the, uh, or OR gateway as well, the expressions that go here and here, right? Uh, for every data object that you have in the executable process model, you have to specify a schema. Some systems will do it with XML schema. Some systems, uh, mo most systems though, will do it with a, a ER-like or UML-like class diagram slide notation. Uh, and uh, then you have to specify for every task, you have to specify who is going to perform this task. How is the task going to be allocated to a performer? 
uh, and if it is an automated task where you send a message or receive a message or you service task where you send a message and expect a response, uh, you need to specify the, the, where the service is located, uh, how to access it, and what is the expected input of the service and the output of the service, and how are you going to map the, the data in your process into those required inputs and outputs. And most systems will provide you a way to, uh, to, to guide you through this cheat, cheat, <coughs> cheat thing. Um, so this is Visagi, Vis Visagi Studio, you, if you have managed to open it. Uh, you can create new projects, that's the first thing. And you need to check if it's actually creating them because sometimes if, if there is an installation problem you will notice it when you create a project that it takes like one hour so maybe you have to configure your IIS server or something like that. Um, a, you can see your existing projects. Projects is like an automated process. And Visage has something very interesting here called uh, Process Central, which is a set of uh, process templates. Um, let's say, uh, a, te a process for recruitment, a process for accounts payable, which means uh, receiving invoices and paying them out, uh, a process for help desk support, a, post a, a, policy, a process in an insurance company for uh, basically selling insurance policies, which is called policy on the writing, uh, a purchase requisition process called purchase request, travel request, vacation leave request, etc. Uh, and it's very interesting because um, when you start, uh, you always have like questions like, oh, how do I do this? How do I do that? So what I would recommend is like when you do HTML, you know, do you ever really write HTML or do you go and find the right snippet and copy it into your page, right? Or JavaScript. Do you seriously write JavaScript? Or do you go and find, how do I do this? Oh, I found the code snippet and I copy it. Someone was telling me that uh, uh, teaching Python is very problematic. You know what's the biggest problem of teaching Python in practice? Is that the indentation in Python is very important. You know, if you, if you do not indent properly, uh, then the program doesn't compile. The biggest problem of, of, of teaching Python is that students complain that when they copy code from Stack Exchange, it doesn't, Stack Overflow, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that's to say that uh, yes, you know, let's go and look how other people do it. You have a process description in PDF that tells you what the process does and how what data types it has, etc. And you can install it into your system, which means you can import it. Uh, it will ask you to to create a project for it. It's better if you first create a project and then you import it into an existing project. So you create a brand an empty project and then you you go to Process Central to get a, a, a one of these processes and import it into your project. Or you can create a new project if you want and give it a name. Uh, I have this uh, these accounts payable process already here. I'm going to open it for you. I'm running it in a virtual machine so it gets a little bit slow. You can you press command F it maximizes the Oh yeah I can do it here so but I, I don't know why it would be Yeah but the, the problem is that I, I need the uh, I need the bars the meta I, I need uh, to be able to scroll <coughs> so, Bizagi has this wizard that takes you through the steps. You first specify the process model itself, the to be executed process model. Then you will specify the data types. Then you specify for every user task the forms, the web forms that you are going to show to the user, through which the user is going to provide you information. Then you specify what we call the business rules, particularly the rules in every XOR split. And then you specify the performer allocation rules, which is for every user task, 
how do you determine who will perform the task? Then you have another one for the integration tasks, which is the service tasks, send tasks, and receive tasks, where you, you link your tasks, automated tasks, to external web services, for example, uh, and then you can deploy. So that, that gives you an idea of what you have to do. So first, we model the process. I'll try to force me to give me... Uh, it doesn't want to give me the, the menus, the, the bars. No. Oh, it doesn't want to give me the... Okay. Uh, it also goes down there. Oh my god. I I better do like this. So I click on edit process. So when I click on edit the process, I get the, the process model. This is standard BPMN. Some of you have been using Visage, so you know what, what this does. So once you have your process ready, uh, you can go to see the data types. These are the data types of this sample process I just downloaded. There is a, an entity called purchase request, and there is a way to throw more entities into it, add attributes to entities, right-click right here and add an attribute. For every attribute, you specify the name and the data type. There is a way also to add relations. Relations are like uh, uh, you know links from one entity to another. You know that from systems modeling. Like a purchase request has a relationship to the authority level and has a relationship to a quotation and so on. Um, then these are the data objects that you will be able to address and use in your business process. Then for every user task in here, you'll be able to, so all, actually by default tasks are user tasks. If you don't see an icon, it means it's an user task. You can go and create the form for that task. So I can create the purchase order form and it will open me up a, a, a form builder and the principle of this form builder is that you have on the canvas the data model and you can take elements from the data model and drag and drop them into the form builder to construct your form so for example I would I will in this case most likely take uh, here the purchase request and start dragging and dropping elements from the data model in the in into this uh, uh, form and uh, and then, so I have the city here, and then you can start configuring it, you know, you can change the labels here and so on, like whatever you want. So this is the, you know, city of origin, city of destination, whatever you want to do. And, and normally I have to do this, um, I don't need to save it, I have to do this for every uh, a user task in my process. For every user task, I have to determine what data it needs as input uh, or what data I need to gather from the user for this task. I take it from my data model and I drag and drop it and construct a form for that. Pretty, pretty simple. The next thing will be to specify the business rules. So I can define what we call expressions. I can there are expressions and then there are some other more sophisticated types of rules that you can put Rule, rules that you can execute when a task is started or when it finishes. But we're going to focus on these rules that allow me to, to specify whether I go left and right in every decision gateway. And then there is a, a formula builder that allows you to drag elements of the data model again. And a right expression like this should be equal to a certain value, for example. Uh, and if this is not enough, you can create a new expression and it opens uh, a window where you can essentially write uh, some 
in some basic style uh, uh, syntax. Uh, you know basic, I hope? No? no everybody knows basic. Uh, uh, your routine. Uh, and if you need examples, again, I recommend you to look at the process center and see one that defines an expression like the one you want. Go and grab it, copy paste it, and manipulate it. Right. Uh, then for every task, user task, you can specify the performance rule. In this case, uh, this task can be performed by any user whose user ID is equal to the uh, case creator. This is a special variable in, in the Visage language to say that this is the person who created the process. So the same person who start an instance of this process will have to enter the details of the purchase request in this case. And uh, uh, we, we, won't, we will not care right now about uh, uh, defining the integration interface, which means linking your process with external WSDL files or specifying URLs for REST services and stuff like that. That is if you have service tasks in your process. This one doesn't have, so I don't care too much. And then you can uh, uh, deploy the process. And we'll be uh, deploying uh, into the development environment. OK, this one is. Uh, is configured to deploy into a test environment, apparently. Well, uh, I need the SQL Server authentication details, apparently. No, I, I would I would rather I would rather not. I will run the process in the development environment, so there is an option for that, except that it's outside the, the view of the video projector, so I'll, I'll click it. So there is an option, run the process, so I'll do that one. And I'll run it in development mode. So I just type run in development, so I'm not going to start deploying it to another machine. And then I get the essentially uh, the 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 interface with the work list that people see. This is a default user, you know, who can see that we are able to, there is a task to be performed right now, co-authorize the request. Uh, I can open the tasks and perform it. I can create here new cases of purchase request process that would generate tasks that me as a user or other users I have defined in the system are able to perform. Uh, I can define here, um, Using this interface, you should be able also to find a way to define new users and so on. And there's an admin interface where I can add users, and for every user, I can assign it a role clerk, manager, senior claims handler, junior claims handler, etc. And this should be the same ones that I have in my process model so that they, they coincide. Um, I can change passwords for users, etc. Uh, so, this is the form for approving a purchase order, so I can click approved because this, this field was editable uh, and I can move to the next task. That means that some new task is going to be created and assigned to another user so I, that user will be able to see them in their work list. So that's pretty much it.